Well, if you'd stand with me, we're going to read our passage this morning. Our passage comes from Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 22. You can look with me at the screen or in your Bible. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has, give, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done so that the people fear before him. That which is has already been, and which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, the Rams are in the Super Bowl, and I'm from from, from the Bay Area, so I'm not super excited about that. And I wore a very neutral shirt to show that how indifferent I am to everything that's going on today. Um, And I am a a diehard Bay Area sports fan, so Giants, Sharks, Warriors, I will be against most of you, except for football. I don't really care about the Niners. Uh, Pop quiz. What year did the Rams last win the Super Bowl? 90s is not an answer. It's got to be a year. 1999 against the Tennessee Titans. And after this win, Kurt Warner famously told the reporter, he said, first things first, I've got to thank my Lord and Savior up above. Thank you, Jesus. And in a similar fashion, after earning a berth in the big game by defeating the Patriots, Ray Lewis famously told reporters, God doesn't make mistakes. He's never made one mistake. God is amazing. Well, check this out. According to the Public Religion Research Institute survey, 95% of Americans believe that God plays a role in determining who wins sporting, sorry, 25% sporting events. Over 50% of Americans believe that God rewards athletes who have faith with good health and success. They also found that most Americans believe that God is in control of world events, but he doesn't control things like natural disasters. Look at this quote. It's interesting that most Americans believe in a personal God and that God is in control of everything that happens in the world, but then resist drawing a straight line from those beliefs to God's direct role in judgment or natural disasters. This is Robert P. Jones, the CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute. And then a poll by Baylor showed that 40.9% of Americans agree with the statement, God has a plan for me. And those who agreed with that statement thought that financial success was just a result of working hard and your own ability. All of these kind of stats combined with the really depressing stat that most Americans believe that Ben Franklin's quote, God helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible, which it is not. It kind of paints a sad and, and weird picture of what we believe about God, who we believe that God is. That God has a plan for my life, and it's for me to have less pain, more money, when I work hard. It's one of the most dangerous false teachings that is circulating around today. But not only is it not true, it doesn't even work. So what's the conclusion then when that falls through, when life is hard, when life is challenging? 
well, either it's your fault and God's punishing you, or God has dropped the ball. He's failed in some way. He's not holding up his end of the bargain. Well, this morning, our passage in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 22, is gonna help us answer the question, what does it mean for God to be in control, especially when life is hard? And how should we deal with those hard realities of life when they come our way? We've talked already about the importance of understanding genre when you read scripture. And while the New Testament, which is probably what most of us read when we're reading our Bibles, it's often what we preach through in church most of the time, it's very instructional, it's very obvious, it's very clear what you're supposed to do, kind of puts the cookies on the lower shelf for you. Wisdom literature, which is composed of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes, it's very different. It's not about getting to the point or going straight to some kind of easy application for us. Instead, it's a beautiful, often artistic way of inviting us to examine life and what wisdom God has for us in this life. Well, Ecclesiastes 3, it begins with a poem, not something that we talk about often in church, and not something we really study much, but this poem is about the seasonality of life, the good and the bad, the contrasting extremes of the human experience that we all are familiar with, because life is complicated, right? And this artful poem kind of paints the range of what human experiences are like, birth and death, planting and reaping, killing and healing, breaking and building, weeping and laughing, mourning and dancing, casting away and gathering up, embracing and distancing, seeking and losing, keeping and throwing away, tearing and repairing, being quiet and speaking up, Loving and hating, war and peace. It's not a very encouraging poem, is it? But all of these things either happen to us, they happen to people that we love, or we just see them happening in our world. And it's kind of a sobering but also normalizing reminder of just what this human life is like. And I don't know, when you hear that list read, it's, it's kind of, it resonates with us. That's the beauty of this poem. And when I read about this, I thought about the stories in this room not generic or general ideas of what life is like, but the stories I know over these last couple of years when I look at your faces here and as I thought about you. And so I just kind of wrote my own version of it, just thinking of the things that we as a church and that you as people of Story Church have been through. For everything, there is a season and time on this earth. Freedom from sin and secret addiction. Reconciliation and abandonment. Forgiveness and betrayal. Building on momentum and starting all over. Raises and furloughs. A budget surplus and a budget crunch. Upgrading and downsizing. Growing the business and having to close the doors. Dreams coming true and dreams getting crushed. One step forward and three steps back. Meeting new people and your friends turning away from you. A medical cure you've been waiting for and a discouraging hospital visit an exciting pregnancy and devastating infertility, a new engagement and marital conflict, family stability and family breakdown, a successful surgery and a devastating diagnosis, the birth of a child and the death of a loved one. We all feel the weight of time, the weight of these seasons, how fragile life is, And we wish it was all easy and happy and it was all of the positive things listed in that poem. We want more dancing and laughing and healing and enjoyment, but we also feel the brokenness of our world. We feel the pangs of of our sin and suffering. And just as I look out at all of you, people that I love, people that I am praying for on a regular basis, I just, I know that just like me, you've been hurt over these last couple of years. You've had people burn you. You've struggled financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually. You've doubted your faith. You've asked, why is this happening to me? And does life get better than this? This poem doesn't really give us answers to those questions, but it hits us with this reality that all of these things are our experience. And the the, the real hit of this poem is it is depressing. It's discouraging and hopeless unless God is part of the picture, because if he's not, then life is meaningless. What is the point with all of that? If we can't control anything, and life is this pendulum swing between these extreme, difficult, and good experiences. But God is in control, and that's what we're really supposed to resonate with here, that nothing is a surprise to him, that there is a time and season for everything. Well, verse nine asks the question that we probably feel after reading that poem, and as I even just read that list of things that you may resonate with in your own life. 
What gain has the worker from his toil? This is verse nine. In other words, if we will still experience hardship, then what is the point of trying? If God being in control includes hardship in my life, why not throw our hands up and just stop trying, just give up? Well, let's see what the answer is, starting in verse 10. I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. So what's the answer to our question of what's the point? What is the fruit? What, what really comes from all of our work, all of our toiling in this broken world? Well, the speaker says that God has actually given us what we have, that our very work, our toil, it's from him. He made everything and that it's beautiful in his timing. But even more than that, it's actually his intention that we don't get to know everything, We are physically and mentally limited by God's design that we can't see the whole picture. And verse 11 says that only he is the one who can do that. Again, this is his design for us. This is not by accident. Why does this matter? Well, because this goes against the grain of everything we do, everything about us. We're constantly seeking as much information as possible, wanting to be informed, wanting to plan everything. Our our whole life is about prepping for the future, avoiding discomfort, and trying to predict what is going to come next. You know, as we grow out of childhood, we gain, obviously, a lot of perspective and insight and wisdom. We learn that we need to leave childish and adolescent ways behind, that we have to work hard in life, that you can't just be lazy, things don't just come your way, and that taking responsibility for your actions is necessary, both to survive but to grow up. And these are good things. As you get independence from family, you start paying your own bills, you have your own place where you live, uh, maybe you get married, whatever it is, there's a sense that you start to create your own identity and to break away from the childish ways of depending on your parents. But the problem here is we start to believe that we are self-sufficient and that our hard work, again, just like those stats, that our hard work is going to result in good things happening to us. And that's really what the world says, that there's winners and losers, that people who work hard and are smart and make the right choices, they do well. And people who are struggling, it's their fault because they're dumb and they didn't do a good job in their lives. See, in transitioning into adulthood, we lose something pretty huge, the right perspective. We've pretty much just swallowed up this American idea of autonomy and that as an adult, you're not supposed to need anyone or anything. Well, Matthew 18, three through four says this, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, children think that they know the best. Kids think that candy is an acceptable meal, that running in the street or carving your names in people's furniture or putting anything in your mouth is just totally fine. If they were in charge, they would do all kinds of crazy things. And what happens when you tell them no? They cry, they scream, they think that somehow you hate them and you want to make their lives miserable because you can't possibly love them. Nothing has made Allison and I more sad than when we had to take our little baby Hallie in to get shots. And I can only imagine if she could speak to us and communicate what she would be thinking about the betrayal of a little, a little trip to the doctor's office and then people are injecting things into her thighs. And it just makes you feel horrible. But good parents protect their kids from things that are harmful, but they also introduce things that may not be fun but are good for them because they love them. And little ones don't understand why these things happen. But good parents don't put their kids in the driver's seat of life because they have such a small perspective. They don't don't see the full picture. They don't know what's good for them. And even though it's painful, this is the right way. We know this intuitively. Well, Jesus taught that in order to enter into his kingdom, we have to be like little children, humble and dependent. Verse 14 hits the nail on the head here, that God is the only one who knows best, that God is the only one that's in control. And not only is he in control, but we can't take away from him or add to what he's doing. You see, while you may be an adult in this world, in God's economy and in his kingdom, we are all children. And we have to accept 
our limitations and that we have a very real dependence on our Father in heaven. Just like little children with their parents, only God sees the full picture in our lives. Only God knows what's coming and only God knows what is best for us because he controls, as the verses say, what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen, past, present, and future. And this is actually really good news for us. Verses 12 and 13 say that we can have the right perspective and understand this, that we can actually be joyful and do good enjoying all God has given to us, whether it's our work, food, drink, relationships, all of these things that are gifts from God. So rather than trying to be in control of our lives and then being utterly confused and destroyed when hardship or suffering comes our way or when our plans to to put everything together fail, we take a humble posture as God's children. And this actually allows us to enjoy what he's given to us and then to trust him with it all ultimately, which is what's key And this is all by his design, that we might fear him, that we might love him, and that we might trust him. Because it's actually better that way. That brings us to our first point this morning. God is in control even when life is hard. When you look at our world, it often doesn't feel like this is a world where God is in charge. You think of an almighty good God and you look out at what's going on right now, you read the news, it can be really discouraging and make you wonder, is God good or is he really in control? And again, the author of Ecclesiastes anticipated this question. So look with me starting in verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beast for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from dust and to dust all returns. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. I don't know about you, but that that feels validating to me. Oftentimes when we talk about injustice and brokenness, we want to cover it with, well, God's in control. We don't want to actually address the fact that, yeah, but it doesn't feel that way. And these verses do that. The author of Ecclesiastes himself does that. Kind of tells us, hey, you're not crazy. Yes, seeing wickedness and brokenness where you feel like there should be righteousness and justice, it's disjointed for us. It doesn't feel sometimes like God is in control. And I feel that as a pastor, it doesn't matter that I have seminary education or I'm a pastor. It fe- when I look out in this world, it feels like, why? why? God, why do you allow the things that happen out there, but even here to us? Why, do- why does this brokenness here? God, why aren't you fixing these things? It can be discouraging. You know, even just in the last two weeks, reading the news, which I have tried to take a break from, but I made the mistake of reading it again over the last couple of weeks. And I just pulled a couple headlines of things that I've become aware of that are just devastating when you look out in our world. Russia, as we all know, looks like they're ready to invade Ukraine and war feels imminent and everyone is just on edge. An Iranian man beheaded his 17-year-old wife and carried her head parading it around town as though it was some type of religious justice. A firefighter named Captain Fortuna in Stockton, he was shot while responding to a routine fire, leaving behind a wife and two kids. We are drowning in stories about spousal and child abuse, abortion, homicide, sexual exploitation, racial injustice, and fraud. Hearing these stories that I, that I listed, and just in general, it just makes my blood boil, but while also bringing me almost to tears. If God is in control, then why do we see injustice and wickedness everywhere? As the speaker says in verse 16, when I look at this world, instead of justice, I see wickedness. Instead of righteousness, I see wickedness. Do you feel that? I think we have two tendencies when this is our experience. One is to hide to live in apathy, to just not care about anything at all. And the other is to think that we, as human beings, we need to fight injustice on our terms and in our timing. And here's the problem with both of these responses. Evil is not out there. It's not a problem with other people. The problem is all of us. The problem is sin, which has made it into every nook and cranny of human existence, including every one of us in this room and including me. So we can't cowardly hide from it, but we also can't have this prideful crusade against evil and against injustice as though we are the solution to it. 
Again, the problem is not outside and the solution is not in us. The problem is within us and the solution is outside of humanity. Only God has the solution. And ultimately, we've seen this with time and time again looking at history. Injustice is not solved by human efforts. It doesn't disappear. We can't fix it. All of the variations of of governance, all of the different countries and changes in history, no one has fixed it. No one has figured out the solution to the problem, though we often think that we do. Verse 17 says this, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. We have to trust and believe that God will judge rightly and that in that, God is actually testing us. He's testing us to show, as the verse says, that we are like mere beasts. We are not gods. We are not sovereign. We do not have the ability to overcome and overpower the brokenness of this world within ourselves. Therefore, this truth remains. Humans are not capable of fixing evil, injustice, and wickedness. We just aren't. And I think you and I need to hear this today because many of us believe that if we had a better president, a better governor, a better political party, or a better boss, better leaders, the right policies, or a right change or form of government, that that would or even could solve injustice in our world. And if we believe that, ultimately, our hope is not in Christ. Our hope is in humanism. It's what humans can come up with to solve the brokenness in our world. And we can attach Christian values, reasoning, and tradition to it and tell ourselves that it's, that it's our faith. But ultimately, if it really rests in what man is capable of doing, our faith is not in Christ. It's in this world. If you don't believe me, let's just take a look back at when Jesus walked on this earth. Do you remember what the people thought he was going to do, what his own people thought he was going to do? They thought that he was going to be a savior that would be a political conquering king who would come to Israel, come to Jerusalem, would, he would redeem them and save them from the Roman Empire, and that he would establish a country where they had power, they had influence, and they were in control. But what did Jesus actually do? He came to die. He came to serve others. He rode into town, not on a chariot or with armies, but he rode on a donkey with humility. And what happened? What did people do to Jesus? They had him killed. They had a criminal, they asked and begged for a criminal to be set free and have Jesus killed instead because they wanted to remove him because he did not meet their expectations. I think a helpful question for us to ask is this. Had Jesus come in 2022 for the first time, would you expect him to come fix our government, to take down tyrants and evil people in our world, and then to make Christians a powerful and important people in America? Or would you expect him to spend time under bridges with homeless people and prostitutes and people who have been rejected from society to come help them? Would you expect people or Jesus to come and deal with broken people in this world or come to save them and help them? In Luke 19, we see a good example of this. Jesus spent time with a man named Zacchaeus who had betrayed his own people. He had gone and worked for the Roman government. He'd been a turncoat. He took people's money, he overtaxed them so that he could pay himself more, and he, was, he betrayed his own people. Jesus declares his priorities plainly for us in Luke 19.10 here. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus' priorities were things of eternal significance, not the temporary things that we see. He came to save broken people, not to destroy them. And this passage continues on and on to show us that life is fragile, our flesh is weak, everything ends in death, dust to dust. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. So what should we do? Should we say nothing matters and just throw our hands up and not care? Certainly no. The author isn't prescribing that we throw wisdom and righteousness out the window. But again, the message here is that Apathy is not an option, but the other option is certainly not that we take justice into our own hands, believing that we are the solution to the problems of brokenness in our world. Because we're not God. Injustice is real. It's painful, and it makes us angry. And speaking personally, just as one of your pastors, 
justice is a hard thing for me. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty even-killed guy. They have to turn my mic down a little bit when I preach or up a little bit than when Travis, Travis preaches because he, he kind of makes the sound go like this a little bit on the, on the board back there. But man, injustice, that is something that just gets my blood boiling. I, I wanna protect people who are being hurt, who are being abused, people who are being mistreated. It makes me so angry. And I wish I could fix that. I, when I see it happening, when I read about it, I wanna just jump in. I wanna deal with it myself. But I know I can't because I'm not God and I don't know his timing and I don't know what he's up to. That's why if we place our hope in ourselves or anything else on this earth, we'll ultimately just be disappointed. But even more seriously, when we do that, when we are placing our hope in governments, in social groups, or just in our own ideologies, what we're saying is, God, you may have created everything and you may be in charge of everything, but I don't trust you. I think I know better, I think we know better, and I think we can figure this out on our own. We'll take some pieces from your word, we'll take some pieces of things that you've said, but as humanity, we're gonna try to solve this. We're gonna figure this out ourselves. And that's just foolishness, because we're not divine, we're not sovereign. We cannot overpower evil in our own lives. We can't just fix ourselves. How much more is it obvious that we can't fix the problems that are outside of our personal lives? See, God wants us to understand our, mortal, our mortality, as these verses say, that we are like beasts. We need this right perspective where all things are submitted to him because we are not in control. That's the only way that you can have any kind of peace in this life, peace in this world that is constantly broken and it's all in our faces all the time. Our world is an ever-expanding ball of wickedness breaking down and getting worse as the seasons and times go on, more and more forms of just crazy brokenness and sin and evil that make our stomachs turn. But God is going to handle injustice, as God's word says here. He will handle it once and for all. He will make all things right, but it's going to be in his timing. It's not our timing. And by his means, not by our means. That brings us to our second point this morning. We need to trust God to handle injustice. Well, the first two sections here have hit us with some hard realities to accept. First, we have to accept that we can't control everything, that we can't shift and plan things so that we don't have pain in this life, and that we're more like children than we are like adults, and only God sees everything correctly. And then next, that injustice has pervaded this world. We see it everywhere, but ultimately, all we can do in the end is put our hope that God is going to handle it. We have to trust him and not try to take things into our own hands because his timing is better. Okay, look with me. We're gonna look at verses 13 and 14 and 22 because they're linked. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. So I saw that there is nothing better then, then a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? There is nothing better. We see this phrase three times so far in the book of Ecclesiastes. Amidst all the vanity and this kind of seamless meaninglessness of life that keeps being brought up, the hard reality of suffering and death that we can't escape, the empty promises of pleasure and work, intelligence and good life choices, and the pervasive presence of injustice in our world. With all of that before us, we are to trust the Lord and submit to his control. But it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't say we're supposed to be these like spiritual drones and these monks that just self-flagellate and just don't have any fun and God's in charge and we don't do anything. We, don't, we just sit and wait for him to come back. Certainly not. And he doesn't say that we should stop caring and just wait until life is over either. God's word tells us there is another way there is a way where we can be truly joyful and do good. When we live lives that fear and worship God with our actions of obedience, then we can enjoy God as we trust he's in control. That could be the summary of that. See, when we rejoice in our work, rejoice in what we eat, what we drink, and what we do, we can do that because those things are God's gifts to us. But when we try to exploit those things for joy, the very same things, whether it's your job, food, drink, relationships, the things you own, it doesn't work. 
This is exactly what Solomon tried, as we've seen throughout the book so far. Solomon did things that were bigger and grander than we could ever imagine. And even he, looking out at the top of the mountain on all he had done, all he had built, all he had accomplished, it wasn't enough. Because he was looking to the very things God created to give him joy, rather than looking to the creator instead. So again, we're not supposed to go and try to find enjoyment in what the world has, but we also aren't supposed to just deprive ourselves of fun and be boring, miserable people. It's not one or the other. See, I don't believe it's a coincidence that we are in Ecclesiastes in this season of life as a church in our world, and certainly this, this, this sermon and this Sunday, because we're in the midst of the Olympics going on and we got the Super Bowl tonight. And I think these events really, we could say, are kind of the best celebrations of entertainment that that humans have to offer. We look at the the best money can buy, the peak of human athleticism, the best of the best, all on a global scale for us to watch. Humanity puts everything aside when this happens. We get our big screen TVs, we eat, we drink, we indulge in this kind of carnival of modern entertainment. And as I thought about that, it brought me back to a really interesting experience I had when I lived in Dallas for a few years. See, my in-laws were in town, and my father-in-law is a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. And so we were taking a tour of the Dallas Cowboys stadium, and I'd never been there before. And I was totally blown away by that place. I mean, huge, absurd operation. I mean, Im- impressive just that that thing works, the amount of staff they have working there, the jumbotrons, everything. And we, there was just a moment where I was sitting in, in the stands. You know, there wasn't a game going on. There's just people taking tours. And I'm looking around at this huge kind of marvel that humans have created. And I started feeling kind of sick and nauseous. And I'm like, what's going on here? Why am I feeling this way? And it hit me, this is church for the modern world. This is as good as it gets. This is where come, people come to worship. This is the altar of humanity without God. Yelling, jumping to their feet, clapping and cheering, throwing their money and time and attention at the entertainment machine of sports and music and art and all the things that the world has to offer. And I thought, it made me feel sick because I think I felt how easy it is for us to go and worship there. And why is it so hard for us to worship here? And I don't just mean showing up, that's part of it. I don't mean, you know, just standing there while worship is going on. Why, why is it that our lives, we will move things around, we will, we will give money, we will get physically active, we'll do everything to enjoy and get excited about the entertainment that our world has to offer, but somehow it's, it's harder for us to do that for God. And I'm not trying to shame you for enjoying those things or shame you for going to a Super Bowl party tonight because I'm gonna do that too. But we need to check our hearts here and consider how it is that we're doing these things. See, because if we seek the best of what the world has to offer and we wring it out, trying to extract all of the entertainment and pleasure for ourselves that it has to offer, thinking it's gonna make us happy, it's never enough. It never lasts. You're gonna go to work tomorrow morning and be bummed out that normal life is here again and you gotta go to the office and you got the regular normal rhythms of life and the Super Bowl party and the break from all of the normal things is gone and you're right back into the rhythm of things. It doesn't create lasting joy. It's just this kind of spark of happiness that fades pretty quickly and you need it again. See, what I love about Ecclesiastes is that again and again, it's not telling us to, to avoid fun or that fun is bad. Rather, that we should enjoy the things God has given to us, especially the simplest things, like our ability to work and provide for yourself or your family, your ability to eat and drink and enjoy other people. See, when our posture is one of humble worship and gratitude to the Lord, those simple things in life become sources of great joy to us. I believe that there is more enjoyment to have a cup of coffee with a friend that you love and that you can connect with than any of the peak experiences that the entertainment world has to offer to you. See, verse 13 says that this is God's gift to you. Look with me at the screen. Enjoying God's gifts is better than chasing entertaining experiences. Solomon sought pleasure. He sought entertainment and achievement in sinful ways with his prostitutes and his concubines, but in in earthly ways too that maybe on the surface don't seem sinful of trying to achieve great things and build great things. And it wasn't enough. It didn't work. Enjoying God's gifts is about gratitude and contentment. We become thankful for what he's given to us and open-handed with what those things look like rather than always looking at what someone else has or what you expect or hope to do or have next. 
Are you constantly chasing after something you don't have? Or are you thankful for the things that you already have, the simple things that God has given to you and how he's taken care of you? Do you feel like you need a better car, a better bike, a better TV, a better house, better clothes, better toys, better drinks, and bigger and better vacations? I don't know about you, but I feel convicted in considering that question because I do. I feel that. So this is our final area in the passage this morning that we have to submit to the Lord in. Because when we submit our lives to him, especially when they're changing and challenging, we ultimately, what we're saying is we're trusting him with our future. We're not trying to make it happen for ourselves and in the way that we want it to. We trust him with injustice, that despite what we see, he is in control, he knows what he's doing, and that he will deal with justice once and for all, and he will deal with it in his timing and with his plans. And lastly, we submit our version, our human sinful version of fun and pleasure, which is something that is often twisted for our own gain, and it terminates on itself. And instead, we turn that back to the Lord. We praise him for what he's done, and we thank him for the simple gifts that he's given to us. God's word is spoken pretty, pretty plainly, I think, to us this morning. And that brings us to our third and final point. There is nothing better than doing good and rejoicing in God's gifts to us. So as we close, I just have some questions for us to think about. So I just want you to kind of just take a moment to breathe out and maybe close your eyes and just think honestly about these questions. Have you been in despair about life because of unexpected suffering or things not going the way you planned? Do you overextend yourself trying to control and manage everything to avoid discomfort? Have you put your hope in a country or a politician or policies, movements, or human groups to solve injustice? Do you give yourself permission to be a glutton or a fun addict for whatever it is, eating or drinking, binging entertainment games or vacations? Now look at me. You know, I feel that. I make those mistakes too. I find myself in that place where I feel ashamed when I realize that I've gone down some rabbit hole reading too much about something or researching something too much or watching too much of a show or whatever it is. I feel my heart has been drawn into something that is not Christ and I've, that, that thing has become too important or too much of a focus in my life. And you feel shame when that happens. You feel guilt. You feel sick. You feel terrible. But praise be to God that he takes our shame he takes that from us, that we don't have to earn his favor back, that there is more grace for us, even when we realize that we have strayed away from him in those ways. I have to remind myself of that grace time and time again so I don't fall into a place of discouragement and self-loathing. So I want you to hear that. I want you to feel condemned. God is inviting you out of that place back to him. See, all of us are guilty for falling into these traps. Really, they're just lies that promise fulfillment in this life but they all fall short. None of them work. In the end, they all just disappoint us. And I don't want to live that way, and I don't think you do either. God has invited us into a better way, a way that he actually designed us for and intended us to live, that we might be like humble children, dependent on him and enjoying the good gifts he gives us and trusting that his ways, his timing, his plans, there's something we can't understand, we can't see, but they're actually good. That phrase just keeps coming back again. There is nothing better than doing good and rejoicing in God's gifts. There is nothing better. Do you believe that this morning? Well, if you aren't a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe this is a wake-up call for you. Maybe you've been on this treadmill, this hamster wheel, rat race of life, trying to find enjoyment, trying to find fulfillment, trying to find your identity in things, and it just doesn't work. Work is never enough. Money is never enough. Relationships are never enough. Things are never enough. Something bad always happens, but even if it doesn't, the good things just can't satisfy you. Well, friends, Jesus can. He came to save you from yourself. He came to forgive you, to redeem you, just like Zacchaeus. He didn't come to the scum of the earth to put them in their place. He came to invite them out of that place, to follow him and to find life. If you are a follower of Jesus today, I think we need to reorient our perspective and we need to take on the posture of humility, which is an ongoing practice. It's not a one-time thing because following Christ is not signing up for life of more fun and more money and less pain. God's perfect will for you includes suffering. It includes hardship. 
And just like a good parent, our Father in heaven knows what is best for us, that he tests us, he grows us, and he shapes us, even through pain and even through suffering. Hebrews 13, five through six says this, keep your life free from a love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? See, our God is a wise God in control of all things. Jesus came to save us from ourselves and give us a new life in him that is so much better than what the world has to offer. He's the solution to all of our worries, our concerns, our fears, and our anxieties. Not only has he saved us from sin and death, but he's actually invited us to follow him, to surrender to him, and to find joy in this life that's real, that's not something just for eternity. It's some joy and peace we can have in him today. But we fail to do this. We fail to submit. We fail to follow him fully, don't we? All of us have to repent here. And that just means we can't just recognize that there's a problem. We have to actually take steps to turn from it to change our behavior, to walk towards him instead of away from him. See, instead of indulging in fun addiction, attempting to control and plan and overtorque everything in your life, or putting your hope in earthly solutions to injustice and brokenness, we can choose to put all of our chips in, all of our hope in God alone. And when we do that, when we trust him with our world and with our very lives, This is the way that leads us to lasting peace and true joy, freedom to enjoy all that he's graciously given to us because there is nothing better than trusting him and rejoicing in what God has given to us. Pray with me. Father, what an appropriate time and season with Super Bowl Sunday and Olympics and so many fun things going on for us to step back and consider not only how we view the brokenness in our world, the brokenness in ourselves, how we view our plans, our hopes, our futures, and how we view injustice. And lastly, how we view pleasure and enjoyment and fun. God, I ask that you would help us, help me to surrender those things to you, to enjoy Super Bowl parties and fun and friends and work and all the things you've given to us, in a way that doesn't terminate on itself, in a way that doesn't lead to us worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And Father, I feel the pangs of sin. I feel it in my own life, in my own world, and I feel it out there. I see it in our church. I see the brokenness that is around us. And I see the injustice that takes place in our world. And it it hurts, it makes us angry. Father, help us to be like children who trust that you see what we can't see, that you are bigger than it all, that you have plans, that you know what has come, you know what is happening, and you know what will come. Help us to to believe that and to live lives of surrender that trust you, whether we are in seasons of life going well or if life feels really hard. We need your help to trust you that we might find peace and joy in you alone and not in all the things the world tells us will satisfy us, Father. We thank you that you are in control, that you are good, and that you will make all things right, and that you will bring justice once and for all. We lament and we long for eternity. We long for your second coming. We long for the day when all of that will take place. And so in the meantime, in the already but not yet, Father, we need your perseverance. We need help. We need you to to give us energy and vitality. God, I pray that for each one of us, we would not go try to plan our lives and and fix things and deal with things on our own, but we would be like trees planted by streams of living water, that we would be dependent on you day in and day out, that you might sustain us through what life looks like now, tomorrow, and in the future. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your word and for the life and wisdom that it breathes into our lives. Help us to accept it, to believe it, to repent where we need to repent and to follow you more faithfully. We ask all this in your precious name, Father.